On today's podcast, I'm joined by Marketing Director Neil Davies and Joe Thielen and Jaden Quinlan from our Engineering and Ballistics Department. We're talking all things 6.5 PRC. We start way back in 2012 with some input from George Gardner of GA Precision, and we walk through the history from its design up until when we publicly released it in 2018. We talk about its match application and how it has quickly become one of the favorite hunting cartridges out there. If you're interested in the 6.5 PRC, then this is the podcast for you. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I'm your host, Seth Swerzik. Joined today across the table, I have Marketing Director Neil Davies. Neil, thanks for coming on. Yeah, buddy. Thanks for having me again. You always bring some good commentary about <laughs> the background of the, of the product and actually using it in the field. But today we're joined by some of our technical guys, some familiar voices out there. Jaden Quinlan, Senior Ballistician, and across the table, Joe Thielen, Assistant Director of Engineering. Guys, thanks for coming on with us. Sure thing. Thank you, Seth. I'm pretty excited about today's topic because it's one that you know, I know you guys had a big hand in. You've used it. Neil, I'm sure you've used it all over the world, and uh, it's the 6.5 PRC, the Precision Rifle Cartridge, and uh, it's a cartridge that really lives up to that namesake, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people putting a, wa- a lot of water in that bucket because it does a lot of things well, and uh, let's talk about maybe some of its uh, history, some of the design attributes, where we went with it at first, and, and where we're at with it right now, so uh, Neil, you can speak to this probably better than anybody. Let's rewind the clocks uh, to uh, before I started at Hornady in, in maybe 2012 era. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that long ago. But or, I'm sorry, I guess I did realize that that conversation happened that long ago, but I didn't realize it took us that long to actually finally introduce it. So um, history of the PRS, um, you know, the, the limitations within PRS, you can only shoot, uh, it has to be a 30 caliber small projectile. The maximum velocity was 3,200 feet per second. I think that still holds true today. It is. So at the time, people were playing around with a bunch of different cartridges, and our good friend, my good friend, George Gardner, um, came to me at SHOT Show and uh, talked about maybe this another cartridge option that he was trying to investigate, and he wanted to do kind of a, a, a short magnum or compact magnum version of a 6.5 is what he was looking to do. What he wanted to build it off of was our 300 RCM cartridge case, or even 338 RCM, I guess. Wouldn't have mattered. But uh, long story short, I went back after shot, and I found him like as many cartridge cases as I could find at the time, which was not very many. I mean, I'd look in drawers, and <laughs> this is also around the time of you know the, one of the first initial or maybe secondary huge spikes in ammo sales in 2012, and then obviously in 2013 after. Things uh, just you know, demand was high, so we weren't making a lot of 300 RCM at the time. We didn't have a lot of brass laying around, so I found what I could, and I shipped it off to him. And I don't even know 20 20 sticks. I'm not even sure. Wow! And that became the basis for what would ultimately become the 6.5 PRC. Not completely, but that was the first Wildcat version of it. From there, he couldn't get enough of our brass. He tried to place an order, but at the time, just didn't have the capability to to fulfill it. We were so backordered on everything else at the time that doing an OEM product for somebody like that, that was just kind of a wildcat, we we didn't have time for it. I mean, if you wanted to buy some brass that was maybe in something that we were already making, perhaps, but doing a wildcat, because, you know, folks out there don't necessarily understand, but when you have production machinery, well... You have to go through a process of R&D in order to make this wildcat and, and proof it out. Well, the whole time you're proofing this process, you could be making product that could be sold. Mm-hmm. And we had a very hungry consumer base at the time, still do. Um, so anyway, George then had to go to what would become the 6.5 RSOM or the, what was it? Gap 6.5 4S. Gap 4S yeah. or whatever. I mean, it's the same thing. It was a RSOM uh, case neck down. And its limitation was that it fed, it's rebated, so it fed fine out of a detachable mag, but it didn't feel feed well out of a box mag. So fast forward years later, and uh, I'll let these guys take over on that part, but 
the 6.5 PRC started to come about. We now had time to do R&D. We had time to proof this concept out and came out with this cartridge. But now it was not exactly what was originally wildcatted. And normally things aren't. You know, that that's, mm-hmm. you know, some shade tree stuff that happens and then it gets refined once it comes here to these guys. Sure. Yeah, so to, to summarize that or call out some points that are kind of interesting, uh, in the precision rifle world now, you've seen everybody go to really small, light recoiling six millimeters. But at the start of the PRS, they were, uh, a lot of shooters, instead of going really small, low recoil six millimeters, they were going six fives. Sevens. Of, yeah, all the ballistic coefficient you could ever want at the speed of light to try to buck the wind just a little bit better and get you know a few more impacts. So that's kind of interesting to see that uh, over, the, over the last few years, there's really been a, a paradigm shift from really fast six fives to really moderate six millimeters. But uh, I wanted to note that this is important. And we talked about it in the 300 PRC podcast where Joe had mentioned, when you look at the design and the invention, I'm going to use air quotes, the invention of the cartridge, where did it have its roots? What was it designed to do? Well, then, I mean, sorry to interrupt you, but like then, you know, they were, these hand loads were not 3,200, but they were blistering fast. I mean, they were over three, oftentimes 3,100. So, I mean, they were, they were smoking. Well, that's what they were. 31, George load, like 31 something. So, I mean, they were, they were getting everything they could out of them. 31, 40 grain bullet. Yeah. Yeah. So this one has its design originality in precision. It has to be Mm. an, an accurate cartridge. And we know something about how to design a cartridge in chamber that just lends itself to really good accuracy. So that's going all the way back to 2012. Well, we didn't introduce this cartridge to the world until 2018. So on the design standpoint, where did you guys pick up on this? And then what did you do to get it to present day ready to launch to the public in 2018? I don't remember what year it was, but we kind of had to wait for that demand period, Neil, that you were talking about that prevented us from making that contract run of brass for George in the first place. We had to kind of wait for that to die out enough to be able to get back in and R&D it. That was probably, what, 15, 16 time That's when we started working on it, was that 15, 16, hey, we'll make some brass, we'll get some test barrels. And this one kind of, I mean, we we worked on this one when we had time, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was still busy then. I mean, oh, it's absolutely. Not like demand went to zero and yeah. we had yeah. nothing to do. Yeah. So at the same time, demand is either at minimum staying constant, but likely climbing, but we're also adding more space, more machines, more people. Yeah. So our bandwidth for brass production has gone up and is continuing to go up. So that probably played a, a role in it. Yeah, yeah, that helped. And we always wanted to do the cartridge. Yeah. I mean, for Neil sure. hinted at that. We wanted, it's not like we're like, hey, yeah, we want to do this. It's a good idea. We just didn't have time to do it. And it was tough because, I mean, so I'm still, you know, within the industry, and I think we've we've talked about this on other podcasts. I mean, we get to be close to a lot of things, but I'm still an enthusiast at heart. Mm-hmm. So 18-year-old me is still excited to say, oh, yeah, this is cool. Let's do this. Yeah. But unfortunately, the, the factory doesn't, you know, doesn't bow to my whims. But, sure. <laughs> um, you know, things have to fit and they have to make sense. And that one, it certainly did make sense. It's just that the timing was not perfect for us and, okay. and, and we just didn't have that space at the time. And I suppose, you know, you look through history, there's probably been lots of things like that in a variety of industries. There's probably been some amazing inventions that just didn't, didn't come to be, but eventually we, we got this one out there. And, um, so I think we, we were talking with George, George was, George was part of the process as we were starting to refine this thing. But it was our cartridge now, and we were going to make it the you know within yep. some of the design parameters that he had wanted it to be at the time. But we're we have to make it such that it's a commercially viable yeah. cartridge. Mass produced, Sammy approved, all of those things. Well, that's, that's a, a that's yeah. a really important one. The Sammy approval. We see this a lot of times with the cartridge that comes out of the Wildcat world. It it gains prominence there. You know, it's performing well, and it and it gains a following, and there's demand for hey, this thing or something close to it has a place. You know. So then we take a look at it and our job is to standardize it, right? We need to be able to make ammunition that's going to fit fire function in every gun that's made out there uh, according to Sammy spec. Well, a lot of times in the wildcat world, a parent case is taken and it's either necked up or necked down because it's existing and it's easy for the guy messing around with it to do it. But when you do those things, you, you change the way the propellant is burning inside the bore 
And without a pressure measurement instrumentation, you know, a pressure and velocity barrel, you have no way to measure it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times in the wildcat world, in the Gap 4S or the 300 Remsom case is a perfect example where it's a little bit too big for necking it down to 6.5. And so that's why you see the return back to the PRC, the parent case, like that cartridge case with the, with the amount of propellant that you need to put in there um, to be within the pressure limitations of SAMI. That cartridge case is a better fit for that mm. than the Remsom cases. Yep. I think another good example in that same vein is when you look at uh, Wildcat World, and it's pseudo standard now. I mean, it is a SAMI approved, but you look at 65284. When we first launched this cartridge, I think we all probably heard the, you know, oh, I've been doing that with the 65284 for years. And that's cool that you can take a 140 grain bullet and 58 grains of Rotumbo and run a 140 grain bullet at 30, 50. But you're at, who knows, 67,000 pounds of pressure. Right. And just because you can do it and your bolt opens fine, it's not a good reason. So the standard SAMI approval is monumental for for everybody to get on board. So all the gun manufacturers, not just the custom guys, but everybody can can have a, a slice of the pie. But in the SAMI standards world, you guys push the boundaries with overall length. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yep. the standard short mag, the RCMs, the Winchester short magnums, 2.825, that was maximum allowable overall length. And you guys stretched it out a little bit. Yeah. So this is one of the cases where build it, they will come. And we actually had this, we had that discussion. We had, a, we had lots of like kind of, we not did. heated, but. But like, just discussions of just where does it, sure nothing, we were nothing, the right nothing exists out there that's going to magazine feed this right now as now. You make a mod to this or that to make it work, absolutely. But our all along our three was, and we got to remember that we were developing and working on some pretty high performance bullets at that point. Yep. Heavier, you know, sleeker 6.5. I mean, all the calibers bullets, but specifically in 6.5, we were like, okay, now we give this bullet a better launch platform. You know, we really have something that shines. Yep. Uh, you know, the super high performance that you get out of 6.5 PRC. So, yeah. The timing yeah. was good, though, because we'd done in 2015... 2014, 2015 for 16, I believe, somewhere in there, was Precision Hunter, ELD Match, ELD X bullets. Yep. So exactly. You know, now we're going to end up with this cool yeah. cartridge. That'll the help 147 us. ELD Match okay. bullet was relatively new. Yeah, and you one, guys stretched it out an eighth of an inch longer than uh, any the, other short mag. On the PR, 6.5 PRC load length, yeah, mm-hmm. 2.955 max. Yep. So, I mean, you're and talking... That was, that was a risk. I mean, yeah, yeah it really was. was. The easy button for the ammo guy is to make it fit in the envelope that the gun guy already has and don't mess with his stuff. But like you said at the start, precision rifle cartridge. If you do anything to this cartridge that doesn't help it in the precision uh, realm, you're doing it, you're doing something wrong, right? That's not your end goal. Your end goal is precision. So do everything you can to support that. Well, seating that bullet deeper in the case, so it fit in a 2825 length, that's not helping you with precision. You have to get the bullet out of the case. Yep. And you had to have enough propellant to achieve yeah, to get velocity their velocity and, and the performance what's the what's the internal box on a rem 700 it's like 2.8 20 yeah, 2.850 right? would be like absolutely yeah, hitting the yeah. you that's know. it but like you said joe if you build it they will come and it's pretty widely adopted now i mean you that can was buy jason it. hornady's deal i mean once we set once, up on this thing you know his quote was we've built this you should build a should magazine build a, and her gun that will yes. work with this thing because it, it does everything we say it does We've talked about that over the years, like why, why within our ballistics, you know, tech, well, everywhere, marketing, ballistics, down the hallway, whatever, we, we do not want to limit cartridges and bullets or what ammunition, if you will, just because the, all the gun can't accept that. I mean, we don't, we don't accept that as an answer. No. Nope. Don't build a, build it, build substandard because it'll fit. I mean, why, why do that? I mean, that's how technology and everything gets moved forward is build, build a better way to to do something yeah yeah that's a, a perfect answer and the 6.5 prc you whether you buy an off-the-shelf relatively affordable rifle or if you get something completely custom they all every 6.5 prc i've ever been around has shot really well right out of the box you can get factory ammo and that lends itself to excuse me that owes uh that design attribute to how we design a chamber and cartridge and how we do that concurrently and it's the same methodology that we've been using since the Creedmoor, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Same thing of all the precision rifle cartridges, the Creedmoor, ARCs, the whole work, they all follow the same methodology when they're getting 
ran through design. Yep. And so you get something that's efficient, that's balanced. Uh, you know, it's slightly overboard, but nothing crazy. Um, and yeah, you end up with a, a cartridge that's just turnkey accurate, whether you buy the, the most affordable rifle you can, or you spend thousands of dollars on something custom, you're going to have a rifle that shoots and performs. Now, when you guys launched this uh, to the world in 2018, it has a lot of match application, and that was really its design, you know, it's where it started. Um, we used it right out of the gate. I remember going to Sawatch, Colorado, and that was the first oh, match yeah. I'd seen, yeah. uh, seen that thing shoot. Um, from a match standpoint, what do you guys see as the advantages of the 6.5 PRC in the precision rifle world and maybe some of the disadvantages? Well, I, I think in the early days when George was messing with it in the, that 2012 time frame, there wasn't nearly as many positional stages at a PRS match back then as there is now. So you have to remember that when you think about where this cartridge came from. At that time, probably over 50% of the, the stages were a prone stage to some level or another. Well, 6.5 PRC is going to be the king of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, as you get to the crazy positional stuff and into the circus stage type stuff, the little sixes are going to be a better option because there's less recoil. But yeah, as far as laying down on your belly and having a laser beam that doesn't move that's what it is yeah that's fantastic and so i referenced that swatch colorado match joe was shooting i think a ga built rifle mm -hmm. um 26 inch barrel uh and that thing shooting One, prototype aluminum tips weren't you i'm pretty sure they were they were 147s or 153s or some prototype in there at like 3050 or 3030 or whatever it was it was pretty fast it's pretty fast but i remember shooting that match and the majority of us running 6.5 creedmoor and then we'd come off the stage and, you know, oh, I was holding, you know, a mil one. And then Joe would be like, mil one? I was holding six or seven tenths or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it was. I do remember that. <laughs> yeah. You you go first and find the wind for us. Yeah, and then we'll just multiply it the times wind. two yeah. and that's yeah. what we that's hold. Shoot have. the wind cheater first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, at the, and long range, we oh, shouldn't yeah. forget that. When you get, you know, when you get past 800, 1,000 yards, obviously the PRC kicks in. It just does. You're yeah. launching a highly efficient bullet hundreds of feet faster than a, mm -hmm. say a Creedmoor or whatever. It's just, it's going to outrun it. And it Not, still has a place in that world. I mean, there's still people that would shoot it at certain PRS matches. Sure. It's still part of that oh, game. Yeah. I think the, the field style matches where if there are barricades, they're going to be natural barricades. There is a little bit more prone um, where you can really absorb that recoil if you set up a good shooting position. Plenty of a, applicability in the match world still. And on the NRL hunter side too, that's a big yeah, one. Yeah, that's a big right. one now. I was yeah. going to say... Uh, like Joe had mentioned, not only is it getting to the target with more velocity, uh, with less drop and, and less wind deflection, it gets there with more authority and you can see your impacts. And we've talked about it in the ELR world. You can see your impacts if you miss the target because it's kicking up more dirt. But this time you get to 1,000, 1,200 yards, you're getting more signature from that steel. And there's, there's some benefit there too. And like Neil mentioned, the NRL Hunter, this is probably one of the cartridges yeah, for that for, sure. for that so, series yeah you want flat shooting because you're you're ranging your own targets and you're going to screw it up you're going to hit behind the target and get a long range and you're going to hit <laughs> yep. you know a tree branch in front of it and get a short range very optimistic so, yeah <laughs> so the fact that you're going to have range error range estimation error the flatter shooting the cartridge is the more it normalizes that error and the better chances you have that's what the, the prc does absolutely and i think the nrl hunter is really nice in that it it's skills that it breeds are a direct impact on your uh, effectiveness as a hunter. And so you can hunt with the cartridge that you're competing with and vice versa. And I think sure. there's some value to that because uh, you know what it does in the wind. You know what it does for drop. You know at what certain ranges, you know, you need to uh, yeah, hold a little extra or, or whatever. Um, ton of value Absolutely. there. And it's not wildly out of control in a 10-pound gun. No, not right. at all. And there's a six, what sixteen pound class to the heavier yep. gun. So yeah, you can shoot a, a twelve and sixteens. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sub twelve pound. Yeah, so you get a sub twelve pound six five PRC. Is it a magnum going off? Yes, it's a magnum, but it's not. You know, throwing you out of position. You don't really struggle to get back into the mm -hmm. scope like you do with like a a three hundred short mag, for example, three hundred Winchester short right. mag in a hunting configured rifle is quite a handful. Oh yeah. And you can reduce that recoil significantly and uh, still have plenty of, of velocity on target. All around remarkable. So going back to the design standpoint, one question that I have gotten a, a bunch over the years, and I'm not sure who started this, um, 
but it seemed to have kind of almost grown out of hand. Um, but the 6.5 Creedmoor, standard Sammy twist, 1 and 8. And a 1 and 8 twist is sufficient to properly stabilize every 6.5 millimeter bullet we manufacture and any other bullet out there that I'm aware of. And I feel like uh, I've gotten a lot of questions on the 6.5 PRC, do I need a 7? Do I need a 7.5? <laughs> and, and uh, standard Sammy twist rate is still 1 and 8. 1 and 8. And what would you guys, would, would talk to that a little bit, um, maybe why you think there's people that gravitate towards that faster twist with this, with this slightly larger cartridge? Uh, and is it necessary? Is it necessary? No, because the Sammy twist rate works fine at a 1 and 8. Why do they gravitate towards that? It's probably a a bunch of reasons. I mean, there there can be there can be baseline drag benefit from spinning certain bullets faster. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, and and it happens to a varying degree with different bullets. Generally, when you spin a bullet faster, it's not going to shoot as good for dispersion. That's a trade off mm-hmm. most people don't think about. Okay. Um, there is some data out there that supports that bullets that have transonic instability can benefit from a faster twist rate, but that comes with trade-offs. Um, so, so there's no clear-cut answer on what, what data point drove somebody to pursue that path. Um, some people assume that the, you know, the 6.5 bullets that existed up until the mid, you know, 20 teens were 140 class and under. There was none of these 153s or 147s or that stuff. So they, they associate bullet weight with bullet length and bullet length with stability and needing to spin it faster. So they maybe are assuming that, mm. oh, because this bullet's heavier, I need to be a faster twist versus my old Creedmoor that's been around for 15 years now and, and has an eight twist, but it was shooting 140s. You know, maybe that association okay. is going on. Um, but there, there, is, there, there can be unintended consequences by going to a faster twist rate that the popular shooting culture at large does not understand. Got it. So... You heard it here. If you're building a 6.5 PRC, a 1 and 8 is perfectly yeah. applicable to anything you want to shoot. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, like, like I said, I, I've been asked that question a bunch. I wanted to clear it up here on the podcast uh, just to get some good information out there. So up to this point, we've really talked and we've really focused on its design, what makes it awesome, uh, the fact that any gun builder can have a standard Sammy Reamer. Uh, the dimensions are as match quality in air quotes again as any other reamer ever made and that just going to lend itself to inherent accuracy uh with with factory ammunition and then the fact that you know bullets not just hornady but bullets as a whole i feel like the manufacturing is only getting better and bullets are only getting more accurate on the average uh so you end up with a a fantastic solution now that's only half the equation because the other half the half that i'm personally most uh, excited about is the hunting application. And I think it w- was a match cartridge when it was released. We make match ammunition for it, but man, it has really found a niche in the, I'm going to say the Western hunting, but just hunting as a whole. Yeah. I mean, yep. this thing is very well balanced. You've got uh, really nice high quality firearms out there like Browning and Christensen arms and such that, that you can buy right off the shelf that are decked out shoot really really well and uh you can you can have some really extended range performance uh, given the right size of animal with this thing Uh, so from the hunting side did you guys think when you were designing it and talking about it that it was going to be not exclusively but really adopted as the the hunting cartridge we we knew right away that we were going to load hunting ammo i mean hands down we we had talked about that early on that the 143 ldx and then you make monolithic projectiles for it you just they really shine you know so we yes we anticipated that we knew we were gonna put but it i in, don't think anybody realized it'd be as dominant i was agreed yeah i but was gonna say because when you look at our ammunition back order the precision hunter skew is greatly more back ordered than the eld match skew uh and i'm you know it's hard to prove cause and effect or that relationship but that precision hunter ammo is. I mean, I, I used to always tell people that, you know, they six five creed more and how successful it was. I'd say it's it's lightning in a bottle. Well now what I have to do is probably qualify that and I'd have to tell you that six five creed more is a lightning storm in a bottle and six five PRC is probably lightning in a bottle. Because it's 
it's extremely successful in that mm-hmm. regard. I mean, I don't know where it is in our back order list, but it's it's high. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it is just it's it's a hunting cartridge that has taken over not just the West but everywhere else as well. Right on. And I I heard a, a somebody one time talking like I don't know if I was at a store or whatever, and I was listening to a guy try to explain it to somebody, and I was just eavesdropping, and they're talking about these cartridges, and he's like. Yeah, see, this is a 6.5 Creedmoor. And this is a 6.5 PRC. This is a 6.5 Creedmoor Magnum. And I was like, yeah, okay, now I get it. Because as popular as the 6.5 Creedmoor is, it's just this is a a bigger, you know, batter version of the same thing with, you know, similar bullets. And it just shoots flatter and and does a phenomenal job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you get to put all that performance in a lightweight package. Yeah. You still don't, you don't really give up anything from a 2.8 length action, if you will, a short action to an action that takes a 2.955 and yet you can run a titanium carbon barrel, all the things, and you, you, you have what, a, an ounce or two difference in weight. So you get all the performance at no weight. Yeah. Uh, we should probably talk about that action piece a little bit too, because yeah. I mean, a lot of it just relies on, on magazine length. So, I mean, you can get by with certain length action so long as you've got the right magazine that will accommodate it. Cause I know. run it in, I have my hunting rifles sh- full on short action. But it's a but the magazines have been modded just a little bit so I can accept it. But as far as the cartridges fit, fire, function, eject, all those things, it's a short action. Well, wow. that, that was the goal. Push push the limit on the component from the gun guy. That's the easiest to change. <clears throat> if you come out with a cartridge that forces him to make some new specialty action, it's going to be harder to adopt than it is to just create a new magazine for an existing action. Mm-hmm. That's that's easier. Yeah, that that's true. Yeah. And, it lends itself to, yeah, well, it helped push the boundaries, but now that that's kind of been set, they're, you know, the groundwork is laid and now most gun manufacturers have one out there on the shelf. You can go to Sportsman's Warehouse. I just looked at them the other day and you had the factory ammunition, that that combination is just a whole I mean, mo- most folks that had some kind of a short magnum or compact magnum, with you know, bolt face gun could accommodate this at some point. Yes. They might have to modify their magazines. A lot of them didn't. Some many folks had, you know, factory three inch mags, so they were good to go. Um, but there were a few that had shorter magazines, and they were kind of caught off guard and had to kind of modify. But again, you know, to Jason Hornady's point, look, we built this race car, so if you'd like to accommodate it, you you know, adapt to this thing because it's and and I think that everybody that has adapted has probably benefited from sales. It's it's strong. I think so. I mean, uh, we're manufacturing. The, the volume of, of ammo as a whole is, is incredible. Uh, but the 6.5 PRC, I mean, it is, it's really uh, pretty impressive to see the volume, uh, the, not just that we're producing, but we're producing it because the demand is there. It's really been accepted and uh, it's not seasonal. It's not like the hunting ammo is only in demand during yeah. the hunting yeah, season. Right. It's, yeah. that is very true. It is year round. Yeah. Um, now we don't have uh, a, a separate, podcast yet which we will but about terminal performance but Jaden, i know this is is your specialty so like neil said it's the 6.5 creedmoor magnum Mm -hmm. what does that extra velocity gain you from not only external ballistics but also the terminal performance well at um at closer ranges it gains you more energy on target uh what's important is how that energy is dissipated just because you have energy doesn't mean it's going to do the job it needs to, but how the bullet works is very important. The LDX takes care of that job for you. Uh, we, d- we designed that into it on how it works. Um, but what you'll see with, say, a Creedmoor versus a PRC is that at a, you know, one, two, three, four hundred yard shot, uh, the PRC is going to input more energy into the animal because that bullet's going faster. If you go to, to the other end of the spectrum, whatever you define as your maximum distance you're willing to shoot uh, with the ELDX line of projectiles, your your bottom end is about 1,600 foot per second. And so with the 6.5 PRC, that pushes that out well beyond what the Creedmoor does. So sure. it, it is the race car version, you know, of, of the Creedmoor. It'll yeah. do a little bit more than it will. It'll push the boundary a little yeah. bit more. It'll do everything the Creedmoor does at what I'm going to call traditional range. And then at a non-traditional range, it does does that same thing a little bit further. Mm-hmm. That's that's win-win. Neil, and the six five bullets, you know, long oh, ISDs, yeah. all that type of stuff. Neil, I'm guessing you had a chance to use this early on on some hunts. Uh, yeah, I think. Let's see, so when would that have been? 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. Pretty early on. 
we had some prototypes, I assume, at the time, and went to South Africa with uh, Joe Kurtenbach, and he was with American uh, Rifleman at the time. time, yeah. So, and he was doing a story on the 10th anniversary of the 6.5 Creedmoor, and then at the same time, we're also doing uh, 6.5 PRC. So, we hunted a lot of planes game with it there. Blue Wildebeest, um, Heart of Beast, um, you know, a variety of planes game. I don't think we shot any kudu, maybe a water buck, zebra for sure, mountain zebra. So, it was tested very early on on zebra, and zebra are known to be a extremely hardy planes game and it was a one and done proposition um excellent performance at ranges out to probably five or six hundred yards there depending on uh which animals we were hunting and then later on took it to new zealand as well for red stag chamois tar uh you know and a couple of different folks kind of cycled through the gun on those animals and again you know, did everything we thought it was going to do. Awesome. And some of the tar were, you know, I don't think anything was much beyond 400. You know, everything was at, you know, fairly yeah. reasonable ranges. Um, whereas in, in, in the, in the South African, we were in the Kalahari. We were right close to the Namibian border. And there were some longer shots there because you're in these sand dunes and you come up over the sand dune, a spring buck that you, you know, initially find at 300 yards, they just start this nice little casual walk and, that casual walk turns into 200 yards pretty quickly, you know? Mm. So everything there seemed to be a little further, um, but e- excellent performance. And I, and since then, I think I've shot one elk with it as well. I've seen numerous people kill elk with it as well and used <laughs> all over the place for elk hunting. Yeah. And then kind of a, a fun story, Jason uh, Hornady had gone to Tajikistan. We We did a podcast on this ourselves too, but he'd gone there before us. And when, I don't recall if he was, he was in one of the airports. I don't know if, I assume it was in Tajikistan and Dushanbe. So all the hunters had to pull out their rifles and do all their paperwork and all this stuff. And five, six, six, six guys, I don't recall what it was. Out of the six of them, every single one of them had a 6.5. Five Five of them were 6.5 PRCs and one was a 6.5 RSOM. So. Wow. Yeah, they were all. Wow. So in that mountain hunting world, it's a, it's a big time player. Yep. That's awesome. Now you mentioned elk. I feel like we should talk about that, especially with, with the, the engineering staff in here because you know, we hear that all the time. You read it in all the comments, you get the emails is six, five PRC adequate for elk. And my general response is you can kill anything with anything. It's just, you have to have the right bullet and the right range and the right shot placement. Um, and that tends to hold true, but you've physically killed elk with this cartridge. I mean, it is, it's, yeah, 400 yards. I mean, I was I was in uh, northern Utah and shot him with one shot. He was staggering. He was about to go down. I hit him with a second, but he was done with the first one. Yep. And the bullet did everything we expected it to do. I mean, yep. it went all the way through his thorax, and you know, once we we once we took him apart, you could see it just did a tremendous amount of damage. That's awesome, Joe Jaden. Probably second that opinion. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And some of the concerns people have <clears throat> when they ask, is the 6.5 enough for an elk, is, you know, some people are worried if they hit that, you know, heavy, high-density shoulder bone on an elk that, you know, 140-grain bullet is a whole lot different than a 230-grain bullet or whatever, you know. Sure. Um, but with the with the 130CX, that new monolithic mm-hmm. bullet we have, if that's your concern, yeah, which that's... is a valid concern, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that happens on elk sometimes, right? I mean, yeah. that shoulder's a nasty area and it'll it'll tear a bullet up. I mean, if that's really your concern and what's hanging you up from shooting elk with a 6.5 PRC, then get some of that 130CX because yeah. that yeah. bullet doesn't care. It's going to punch right through that thing without a problem. That was going to be my next thing to bring up because, yeah, if, if you're hunting with the 6.5 PRC, obviously the 143LDX is probably... I mean, the go-to I yeah, mean, deer, absolutely. antelope, you can hunt elk with it. It's, it. it's held to our match standard for accuracy. I mean, it's just amazing. Well, with our new CX bullet that we launched uh, in 2022, we have that 130 grain bullet. And from a design standpoint, it shares a lot of similarities externally to our match bullets. You know, that you look at the 147 ELD match, you're going to find a really, really similar external design shape. And that's going to give you a lot of the external drag benefits um that you love from that super low drag match bullet you guys who designed that one i mean it's obviously in the engineering department but 
the 130. Yeah, I mean, Ryan, Ryan. Ryan and Jeremy. So, but I mean, it was purpose built for this application, right? I mean, that's where, that's where we needed it was in the 6.5 PRC. Absolutely. Yeah. That's where we needed it. Yep. So, so that's why it came to be. That super sexy shape drag. And then the monolithic are the copper zinc alloy that we use. It's yeah. a hard bullet. Tough. Yep. So bullet. punching through shoulder blades, that is, I mean, it's, it's a non-issue. Yeah. Especially, especially with the length to diameter of that bullet. Yeah. Oh yeah. It just doesn't, it just density, doesn't care. So and it'd be an, it'd be another great choice. I mean, we talked about this too in some of the other podcasts, but you know, if you're hunting in, in Southern Africa or anywhere else in Africa for that matter, and you're, you're. That's what you're taking. You're taking a 6.5 PRC. You got to fish that bullet in from the last rib or from the front shoulder, and it needs to get all the way back to go through the vitals. CX bullet is going to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there are no guarantees in the world, but yeah, that sucker is going to give you 36 plus inches of penetration every single time. So you'll be able to get to vitals from almost any angle in, in planes game. Yep. Well, and one of the neat things with our factory outfitter ammunition uh, that's going to feature that CX bullet, the 6.5 PRC, it'll run 143, 147 grain bullet in the 2950 to 3000 feet per second yeah. mark. But we're dropping that bullet weight down because copper zinc alloy is less dense than lead. So now you're only at 130 grains. So not only is it a little bit lighter, you're picking up some velocity and you have a bullet that's going to penetrate, out penetrate a lead core bullet. So you kind of have a really interesting trade off where you trade weight, which you might perceive as a negative thing for a hunting bullet but in reality with that harder material you're getting more penetration you're getting the external drag of our sexy match bullets and then you're getting added velocity on top of it that's mm -hmm. kind of a win-win all the way around it is yeah great great little setup joe i know you've killed a lot of animals with the 6.5 prc uh, mainly deer from what i understand what's your hunting rifle setup look like so mine is the quintessential Western, going to carry it all day, eight and a half pound gun, fully decked out. Carbon Car fiber, everything. Carbon, yeah, titanium action, carbon barrel, lightweight, scope, you can spin the turrets. It's pretty, it's pretty sweet. So yeah, I've shot quite a few deer with mine. I haven't used mine on, I think Christina used it on elk, but I have not shot an elk with mine. If I go elk hunting, I just, I love my 300 PRC. Yeah. I can't get away from that. <laughs> well, <one>. I can't. <laughs> that's I don't know. It's just, intercontinent, it's yeah. just intercontinental awesome. ballistic so, missile. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. Anybody listening hasn't listened to 300 PRC podcast, you know, we, we joked about it. Like it's like calling in an airstrike and I can't, it, it, I can't blame you for taking that. And I, and I should, I should take it some time and just use it because it's lightweight. It's fun to hunt with. I have no issues or reservations with using it using it at all mm -hmm. i just haven't yet but i yep. love using it on mule deer yep and that's what i was going to ask you to talk about i know uh not long after you built your rifle and i remember you building that rifle you were out in western nebraska chasing mule deer and uh it was a pretty decent poke from what i remember yeah there was two of them that fall that were pretty far they just set up on the edge of a cornfield and you were on a pivot you were out in a pivot and you couldn't you're on a pivot you can't walk to the other end i mean you were done and ran out yeah. of daylight so he came out of the hill and stepped on the pivot and let him have it. Wow. At, at 600, 500? Yeah, he was like six and a quarter. Wow. 625 yards. on a, You know, if you're shooting an elk, you know, that's a huge body. But on a deer, it's a little bit smaller target. And at that range, you better be confident in your equipment and your ability. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you've got a pretty slick little setup. Yeah, it works great. I mean, I love it. I won't. I'll keep that gun. I mean, I'll use, my kids will be using that gun someday just because it, it works so well for the, the job it was intended. Hmm. Yeah. One of the things that, that I like the most about it, and, and I've talked about this, I've ran up and down the hallway in the office screaming from the top of the highest Nebraska mountains that I can find. <laughs> so did you stand on a book? <laughs> yeah. The, the 6.5 Creedmoor, um, you know, I've killed a bunch of stuff with it. I know you guys have, everybody around the country, around the world has, and um, it's not the fastest trip down the drag strip by any means. And, and, you know, I've shot some, what I'm going to call non-traditional ranges with it on appropriately sized animals and antelope and, and deer. Um, but to get the performance at the ranges where you're in that gray area between 350 and 650, um, you know, sometimes hunting the sand hills or hunting the, the breaks, uh, here in Nebraska, or you get into Eastern Wyoming, Eastern Colorado, um, that 350 to 650 range, you might not close that distance, and that's as close as you're getting. And to get the performance for that that distance out of a Creedmoor, you run a 24 or a 26-inch barrel. And what I love about the 6.5 PRC is I can shorten that barrel up 
I can gain some ergonomics, but I'm still running the same or faster velocity than a 26 inch 6.5 Creedmoor. And that to me is the ultimate trade off. Um, I just, I can't get enough of running short barrels. It, it really yeah, makes. They're, they're so handy. They're so handy. And we've all been out there. I mean, that same fall, Colorado, you get on, there's those giant, in Eastern Colorado, these giant draws or washes. And you're on one side of the wash and the animal's on the other side of the wash. And unless you're going to watch them go over the hill or wait or come back tomorrow, I mean, you, you, you physically don't have time to skirt all the way around, mm -hmm. up or down. And you can't just go across. They'll see you. So you either lay down and shoot yeah. across the canyon or you don't shoot and come back tomorrow and hope he's there. Wow. The other place where that, you know, your, your short barrel suppress system comes into play is in box blinds. So not oh, sure, just yeah. a Western yeah. hunting deal, but I mean, you've got a 26 inch stick with the seven inch suppressor on there. You're trying to weasel that through a It's like a scalper when you pull yeah, the sword I mean, of the stone kind of <laughs> it stuff. It gets cumbersome. So, you know, having something that works really well, it's compact enough with a, you know, a hunting, whatever, whatever a person wants, five, seven, whatever you choose for your suppressor length once you, once you select that. But yeah, I mean, you're adding five to seven inches on your barrel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you start off with a 20 inch barrel, let's say, okay, well, now you got a 25 or 27 inch long stick, which, you know, that's still a pretty long barrel, let's say. Mm -hmm. So. Those are things to consider, but yeah, yeah, you're right. That system there for uh, your 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 typical whitetail deer hunter is not a bad combo either. No, no. not at all. And yeah, I I kind of I gravitate towards that because it's shorter. It's not getting snagged on stuff. It's easier to pack around or attach to my pack. Um, it's just lighter because there's less material, and it's just yeah, way more ergonomic. But glad you brought that up, Neil, because there is half the st half the country where you know box blind or tree stand hunting is is the norm and suppressed or not shorter barrels are, are just easier to handle especially inside something like a box plane where you're confined yeah. and then yeah you can move it around a little bit easier but you don't have to sacrifice any shot distance you're not sacrificing bullet performance because you have all the velocity you need to really make that bullet work and that's something that i think the 6.5 prc because of those design attributes uh that's why it's been so successful i think absolutely yeah. Yeah, it's been a look. I mean, <laughs> kind of had an interesting start. I mean, it was it it, and it's fun to have seen it begin. It was it was cool to be there. But boy, I'd, I don't know that any of us thought it'd be as successful as it has become. Yeah. That that was interesting. I don't think you know. I don't know something about six five. Maybe I'm not sure. But <laughs> well, and that's a good point, Neil. Like the six five Creedmoor was uh, developed in 07, released in 08, and then it was there. The overnight success that took 10 years. Yeah, but it wasn't right? until 2014, 15 time frame yeah. where it just shoo, yeah. really took off. And uh, the 6.5 PRC, I mean, it was, you hit the go button and it was there. I mean, yeah. it was there. But I and think there's so had, many people offering guns in it. That's you, the other part. And you had huge. already laid the groundwork though. We have been, we have been very diligent about telling that story about better bullets, accuracy, you know, efficiency, whatever we're going to yeah. name it, that. People are starting to understand, like, oh, yeah, they, they built it because of that. Well, that's what I do. I use it for that purpose, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. So. Yep. Well, and that's, yeah, that's, we've, we've talked about that in the 300 PRC podcast. And before I go any further, the 6.5 PRC was the original PRC, if I'm not mistaken. It was released before the 300. The 300 had been around longer. Yeah. 300 yeah, was longer, but as far as. But it never got. Yeah, adopted the official on. knighting procedure where it yeah. got called the precision rifle cartridge well, was correct so as far as the name goes kind of founder of the feast it is yeah which although is, the <laughs> the 30 cal big brother was you know, lurking in the shadows for yeah years before he's always <laughs> been there <laughs> yeah yeah he, yeah it'd been around for a while i think what surprises me on on the success of the 6.5 prc is how fast that precision rifle world evolves. Yeah. And so yes. when George was messing with it in 2012 or the, co the design concept, uh, you know, for that PRS or, or long range field shooting match, uh, cartridge, mostly on your belly. Cause if you shoot that thing on a barricade, like we said, the lighter recoiling stuff is going to be a, a an easier option. Well, it wasn't long after that, that you saw the precision rifle shooting trend that way, where there's more barricades, there's more crazy, you know, kind of that, that sweet spot that it was originally in di uh, designed for kind of slipped out from under the 6.5 PRC, mm -hmm. right? That the game had changed, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it still found success because immediately it still had a place in that game, 
but then on the hunting side, it just went bananas. And so it's really <laughs> yeah. cool to me, you know, the, the success that it holds today with kind of it's, it's, you know, the rug getting pulled out from under it per se, you yeah. know, with that match world just changing so quickly. It, it's cool to see that it's still just chugging along. Yeah. You know? Wildly popular. And what I was going to mention when I was talking about the, it being the first uh, precision rifle cartridge, and I'd mentioned at the start of the podcast that it lives up to that name. Uh, I was going to say that we talked about it in the 300 PRC podcast when Joe mentioned it, that it was designed from the ground up, purpose built, if, yeah, to be an accurate cartridge at range. You want to shoot bench rests with it. You want to shoot F-class with it. You want to shoot stuff far away with it, steel, animals, whatever it is. It was designed with that sole intention in mind, and it shows. Uh, the rifles that are out there are accurate. The ammo is accurate. The bullets are accurate. I mean, it just doesn't get better than when you design something from start to finish with a singular goal of long range accuracy. And uh, that helps the general consumer who isn't a ballistician or isn't a gunsmith or doesn't know a gunsmith or how to build a rifle or, or doesn't know how to reload. It helps them, you know, you don't have to get a custom built 65284 and figure out how to reload and, and work something up that you may or may not be, you know, running close to 70,000 pounds of pressure with. Now, it's it's the easy button, and that that level of accuracy and consistency at range is now available to everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Hornady has done a great job long before I was here, starting with, gosh, probably the you know two hundred four Ruger, the RCMs, the thirty TC, and then you know kind of really skyrocketing with the Creedmoor. They've laid the groundwork with all of the gun companies, all of the partners that we have in this industry. That if we design something, you can hang your hat on it that it's going to be done right from a chamber design standpoint the ammunition design uh the size of the case uh everything about it that goes into a system you know we really do our due diligence and obviously the engineering team has a really good handle on how yeah. to do that it's almost not even a question now uh and so as we continue to develop and we continue to innovate new cartridges and new bullets um that groundwork was laid that you can trust that what we design is is going to solve a problem and it's yeah, going to do that, it really well. That's a good point too about solving a problem. You know, we don't we don't just come out with a cartridge just to come out with a cartridge. It's, it's not like that. It's it's something that's going to provide a uh, you know it's going to fill a niche. Ideally, it fills a niche that the shooter didn't know they needed to have filled. Those are the those are the lightning storms in a bottle. But mm -hmm. we don't just do it just to put our hang our name or do a cartridge. I mean, there's a reason why we do them. And this one, you know, it, and it great, it's great because it was the, I think the first cartridge that we came out with after we'd had some of that foundational technology that advanced with the ELD stuff, heat shield tips, uh, uh, precision hunter ammo, all that stuff. So, I mean, this was the first time that we got to build this, this newer match style cartridge that had this duality. So it, it worked in both hunting and match applications. And that one, the 300 PRC, all these cartridges that have come about, there, there are reasons for them. Mm -hmm. And and that's, Absolutely. that's been a big part of what we do. It's not just to, well, we're bored. Let's introduce a cartridge. No, no, it's because this is a real thing that, and usually it's because there's a whole bunch of people here that want it. And, yeah, and, if, right. and, <laughs> and that's usually the litmus test. That's a good test. If there's a whole bunch of people who are hyper passionate about shooting stuff far away, about hunting, about shooting matches. I mean, that's, that's almost all of us here that work here in a nutshell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and if, if there is a, a tidal wave of employee demand for a certain product or a certain type of product, it's a good litmus test that it's probably going to be successful. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a great point, Neil, that it's not just, oh, we're, de you know, we design cartridges. Every cartridge that we've released, I can tell you exactly what this does better than what it, you know, what was came before it and why it was necessary and why it's better. And uh, it's nice to be able to do that because it, it proves the validity of what you release. And then, you know, I know we've got, just like any other bigger company, you get, you know, you get the, a lot of the internet people, you know, saying it's all marketing hype and marketing hype this and marketing hype that. And my response is always, I don't care how many magicians are on a marketing team, you can only prop up something that doesn't work for so long. But a product that stands on its own and f solves a problem and is a better solution, 
you don't, yeah, you don't have to do anything for that. It just works. And the 6.5 PRC is another fine example of that. Absolutely. Awesome. Gentlemen, I really appreciate you guys talking about the 6.5 PRC. It's, you know, one of my favorite cartridges, uh, running a really short barrel with a suppressor. It's just perfect. (laughs) And, uh, uh, I, I can't say enough about, uh, kind of what a privilege I guess it is to, to work here and to have so many people surrounding us that are again, hyper passionate about designing stuff like this. And from, yeah, shooting whitetail deer in the middle of Nebraska to shooting tar in New Zealand and whatever else, um, six, five PRC does it all really, really well. Yes, it does. Lightning in a bottle. <laughs> awesome. Everybody out there. Thanks for tuning in on this one. We hope you enjoyed talking about the six, five PRC and we'll catch you on the next one.